Greetings. Uh, I'm Ben, and this is another R video. This is part two of the video uh, on CFAs, where you feel like you have good measures, but you don't have good model fit. And the first thing we're going to do, and what part two is going to be devoted to, is inspecting the residual matrix. Um, and so the residual matrix, if you want to know more about residuals, I think that uh, Timothy Brown's book has a really nice discussion of this. I have the book here and on page 98 and 99 there's a really nice discussion of residuals so uh, if you want to know more than you're getting here i recommend that um, but to dive right into it the command that you need to get a residual matrix is resid and then the name of your fit so in the previous video we did fit one to fit our model and then type standardized and uh, Tim Brown in that book recommends the standardized residuals because residuals are in part a function of the metric that they're measured on and if you get standardized residuals you can interpret them similar to a z-score and so if you look for residuals that are about higher than two that gives you a, a, a pretty good idea um, that there's something worth looking at there so if we get the residual matrix as is. Um, you'll notice that because uh, it is a large matrix on a diagonal that, that we're actually getting it in three pieces. So we can start at the bottom. Um, now one thing that's worth noting is the difference between a negative and a positive score. So negative 1.3 uh, is, uh, you know, it's below the two threshold that we were going to kind of look at. But this does suggest a negative number suggests that our model might overestimate the relationship between the variables we're looking at. And so this is attitude one, AT1, and attitude four. And that's a negative 1.3. So it does suggest we might be overestimating the correlation between attitude four and attitude one. But we have this uh, 2.1 here, and that's between attitude four and attitude three. And that suggests that, um, I'm sorry, the negative number means we might be overestimating the relationship, implying that attitude one and attitude four aren't as correlated with each other as our model suggests that they are. Whereas a positive residual suggests that we're underestimating the relationship. So this suggests that attitude four might be more correlated with attitude two than our model suggests. What we're looking for in a residual matrix are numbers or areas of numbers that really jump out. And so now when we go to the second section of the residual matrix, we have all of these numbers that are that are really jumping out. So attitude four has a residual here of four, three, six, six, three, two, four point seven, four point five, five, five point nine. So an attitude four was also the item that we were looking at below. And these are all with so RS is the trait reactant scale. So RS 13, 14, 15. FT1234, those are the freedom thread items, and anger1234. And honestly, there's no reason for attitude four to have, you know, attitude four, if we remember from the scales that we were looking at, is the item that was difficult or easy. So is being a living organ donor difficult or easy? And we said that was more of an efficacy item and not a normative description. And so it doesn't make a lot of theoretical sense for it to have all of these high residuals with all of these other uh, items in the scale, it probably suggests that this item just doesn't fit with that very much. And in this section of the residual matrix, we're not really seeing much else jump out. So attitude two has a positive residual with RS12, but you know, that's, I don't think that means much of anything. Um. So then if we go up to the top, we already know that we're looking at attitude four because it's been problematic elsewhere. And again, we see five, four, seven, six, six over here, um, two. And again, this is, you know, would it be easy or difficult to be a living organ donor? And this straight react trait reactant scale is just how much you do or don't like being told what to do. So having all of these 
high, you know, residuals, I, I don't think it is really telling us that believing that it would be easy or difficult to be an organ donor is highly correlated with trait reactants. I think it's telling us that that item in the attitude variable um, isn't very highly correlated with the other items, and so it has all this variance that um, that it doesn't have anywhere to put. So looking at the residual matrix, I think we're already seeing evidence that um, that easy, difficult item doesn't really belong very well. But beyond that, we noticed that we had a lot of items in the trait reactance variable that we were curious about. Um, and if you didn't watch the first video and you're like, wait, items in the trait reactance video, go watch the first video. It'll all make more sense. Um, but in this, so we can see, um, you know, if you're trying to just scan for big numbers, I thought I saw, ah, here's one that kind of jumps out, a, a 4.3, you know, and that's between trait reactant 6 and trait reactants 4, and so it suggests that those two items have something going on, a, a relationship with each other that's not being estimated. Then we have 5.86 between, what is that, the eighth item and the sixth item in the trait reactant scale. Um, and then we have a three here between the seventh item and the sixth item. And actually, if we look down the sixth item, there's three, 5.8, 4.7, three, two. Um, and so all of these are suggesting, yeah, that sixth item, there's, there's, we're underestimating some of the relationship. Um, and then here it's a negative 1.6, you know, 1.6 isn't that high of a, res a standardized residual, but it does suggest we're overestimating that relationship a little bit. And then with fit, uh, with the freedom threat one, um, we have this negative residual of 2.66. So suggesting that that freedom threat item isn't as correlated with this trait reactance item as our model implies. Then we also have a negative 2.4 with anger one and a negative 2.2 with anger four. So that does suggest that this uh, sixth item in this scale is having some problems. Maybe it's a problematic item or because we see you know, some other items like you know, RS4 has, um, uh, has some, you know, some higher numbers popping up. Maybe this is suggesting that there could be some additional dimensionality in the trait reactive scale, though I don't know. This RS7 um, with RS12 is 2.5, but you know we have a 2.04 here. You know, there's not a lot else. It kind of looks like most of the issues with the trait reactant scale are, are, are kind of located in here with this sixth item. And so, you know, if we're looking at this, it might suggest, oh, let's take another look at that sixth item and see if there's something going on with it. Now, it could just be um, measurement error. It could be in the, uh, you know, uh, survey sampling error um, that's causing that item to look funny. So it could be a perfectly good item, but uh, something weird with the sample caused it to, to react funny. Um, or, you know, it could be that there's more dimensionality to this um, trait reactant scale. Or sometimes what happens is you have items that are uh, kind of redundantly worded, and those items can end up causing some residuals to pop up here. And so I think looking at the residual matrix gives us some ideas and some diagnostic information. And we can go back and look at our measures and say, you know, do we see some other problems? You know, we have this 3.49 for freedom threat one and resistant uh, and trait reactants three. And we would expect freedom threat and trait reactants to have some, you know, theoretically we would expect them to have some overlapping information. Um, but I think looking at this, you know, we can identify some items that uh, that appear problematic, and we can go back to our measures and try to figure out if it makes sense that they're problematic. And we can go back to our loadings and say, like, okay, you know, RS6 had a lower loading. There were plenty, you know, there are others. RS8 had a lower loading. You know, RS10 doesn't have a great loading, but RS6 was really the one where we were seeing some information in the residual matrix that made us want to look at it again. And then, you know, um, attitude four, uh, this is the easy, difficult item in the live 
living organ donor attitude measure. And we saw all sorts of problems with this item in the residual matrix. And so looking at the residual matrix can give us um, some uh, initial diagnostic information. Um, and um, so, so um, some people uh, in the field recommend reporting the residual matrix. Um, some people in the field recommend just discussing it or maybe adding as an appendix. I do think it's useful to look at it to try to find out if there are areas of, mar uh, of model strain. Um, and I, you know, there's no, there's certainly no harm in reporting it. Certainly, you always want to check it. Um, in this instance, I think it, it. Well, you know, I don't know. Let's let's just say we get rid of this attitude four item. You know, we don't necessarily just want to eliminate items from our scales because the data tells us to. But we did decide. Well, that item, you know, theoretically isn't measuring um, the same thing, and we probably shouldn't have included it. Um, and you know, once we remove it, we still see that our model fit isn't that much better. We see our, you know, our RMSCA and our SRMR. There's some improvement, but um, that didn't solve everything, right? And if we were to say, well, okay, we saw some problems with RS62. Let's get rid of that item. We'll find. Oops, sorry. I didn't bring you back to the R window. So yeah, getting rid of the um, attitude four and RS6. See, so we just have RS5 and RS7 and attitude three and attitude five. So we cut a couple of items and we got our CFI up to 0.89 and our TLI up to 0.88 and our RMSEA down to 0.07 and our SRMR down to 0.07. Um, if we look at the residual matrix for that, can we see, you know, what else is going on? You know, it doesn't really look like we've solved the, we certainly haven't gotten the model fit up to where a lot of people would, would expect it or would want to see it. Uh, we see this freedom threat one, there's some noise in the residual matrix. Um, there's still some stuff going on with trait reactants. And remember, when we read through the trait reactant scale, we actually thought that RS6 looked fine. So I don't think we want to remove it just because it juices our model fit a little bit. Um, I think we want some more diagnostic information. You know, we want a little bit more um, information about what's going on with that uh, beyond what we're getting from the residual matrix. And I think just going through and deleting items every time you see some strain in the model, um, that's data-driven respecification. That's not very good practice. You know, that's not what we want to be doing. And so um, in the next video, I'm going to show you how to look at some of the modification indices and see if we can find some, some more solutions to our problematic model fit with modification indices. And then in the last video in this uh, four-part series, I'm going to show you how to utilize parceling to help reduce some of the noise that's going on with a model like this. So thanks for watching. I hope you found that helpful. I hope you do start looking at residual matrices when you're doing uh, SEM models. It's a uh, good practice. It's recommended practice. And you know, once you know how easy it is to just uh, type that word resid in, in Levon and get this output, um, you know, no reason not to. So um, tune in for the next video so we can look at the modification indices.